Good morning, and welcome once again to another beautiful day in the Lord. My name is Pastor Atwater, and I greet you in that matchless and precious name of Jesus our Lord. Uh, hello, Unity. God bless you. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord for our communion service. This is our virtual communion day Sunday, and I pray that you already have uh, your sacraments as we will pray over whatever you're going to use for communion on today, your crackers, your bread, your juice, your water, whatever you may have, as we pray and know that God will bless it, and we will be on one accord as we commune with the Lord on today. But today is another great day when we know our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, has already done everything that needs to be done uh, for salvation, for joy, for peace, for life, for healing, for blessings. Whatever we need, God has it. Amen. So before we go any further, let's go to his throne right now where we can always find help in our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for another day that you have made. We thank you, O oh Lord, that we are yet here to let somebody know that you are our Lord, you are our Savior, you are our all and all. Whatever we need, we look to you and know that when we connect with you, O oh God, we are tremendously blessed. So we pray that you would bless your service on today. Prepare our hearts to be able to commune with you, O oh God, with liberty knowing that we have the freedom that you give to us through the Holy Spirit. And now as we decrease in this place today, we pray that your holy presence would take control of the atmosphere. Bless each home, bless each individual, bless each one who's calling on you, trusting in you right now for whatever the need might be. And we give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. And, and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray, amen and amen. Well, truly, we are so thankful for our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. We all have a journey, and we have all been on a journey. Amen. And it's God who takes us across the choppy seas and across the highways and the byways, and even in times of peace and tranquility, we just give him honor, glory, and praise because we always know that it did not have to be and does not have to be that way. So God is so good to us. And on this communion Sunday, before we commune with the Lord, we just want to talk to you a little bit about our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, and why we have the opportunity to commune with him and why and how thankful we are to be blessed to be able to commune, which means we can have a time of fellowship one with the other, all centered around Jesus. Amen. The Bible says as often as we do it, do it in remembrance of him. So let's share a brief word, and then we will prepare to commune with Jesus on today, a time of fellowship. Let's go into the word. Amen. Without further ado, let's go into the word of the Lord. Luke chapter 5. Verses 21 through 24. Luke chapter 5, verses 21 through 24, and I will be reading from the NASB translation. Let me just say also, I thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your concern. Amen. And for all of the things that the people of the Lord continue to show forth love upon myself and my family. Thank God. And Sister Atwater, amen. Thank God for her and for all of those who have been so steadfast in these times of need. Luke chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. The word of the Lord says this. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, Get up and walk. But so that you may know, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. 
May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Wherever you may be, would you please pause with us and let's just get on one accord spiritually and prayerfully right now and pray our corporate prayer. So just please repeat these words after me. Amen. Just say, Lord Jesus, please prepare my ears to hear your word. Prepare my heart to receive your word. Prepare my eyes to see that your word is alive. And prepare my body to be your temple for the living word. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And I don't know, I pray that you meditate on those words that we pray. Whenever we pray that prayer, that corporate prayer, amen, we're asking the Lord to take control of our whole being from the inside as well as the outside, including our bodies, because our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit which is the living word. So today we want to speak to you on this communion Sunday from these words. We want to talk about so you will know. So you will know. And as Jesus, amen, spoke these words in this very familiar miracle that has been recorded in three of the four Gospels, uh, we understand that there are some things that he wants us to glean from everything that he did while he walked on this earth. There was nothing that happened by coincidence with Jesus. So Jesus wants to show forth the power of God. We hear that word power, power of God. What does that really mean? In the New Testament, the Greek word that's translated power is dunamis. And I know many of us have heard about dunamis and it being the root word of our English word of dynamite, right? So, and dynamic. But that word dunamis also means mighty works. And wonderful works are miracles. So God's power will produce mighty works in our lives. God's power will produce miracles in our lives. God's power is available to those of us who understand that he's pouring it out right now through Jesus the Christ. The word power and God's power also implies that amen, we have more than just the capacity for activity or accomplishments. It will also produce actions and will result in achievements of such magnitude that they will inspire a sense of wonder in others. Why do you think God produced miracles? Why do you think God's word is filled with power? He wants to bring forth and to grab the attention of those who are seeking for something. Many times people don't even know what they're seeking for. But when the power of God is on display, or God shows forth his power and his mercy upon each one of us, then others can begin to want to grasp and to possess the same thing that they see God's power on display through you and through me. But it's actions. It's an action, and it produces achievements. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we find that, amen, before Jesus went back to heaven, he gave his disciples their final marching orders. He said, you will receive power, the dunamis, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So Jesus now says that the Holy Spirit is what we need in order to have the power that proceeds from God operating in our life. Paul tells Timothy that Christians have not been given a spirit of fear, but of what? Of power. He says that we have power, and that's in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, if you want to go back and read it for yourself. So when we realize that we have this power and love and discipline, all of these are in a package that God provides for those who know him. But in order to activate it, there must be something that we call what? Faith. In this section of scripture that we're looking at here in Luke chapter 5, we want to read a few verses and just take a look at what's really surrounding, what's the setup, what is the significance of this particular miracle that Jesus has performed. It's a miracle that we are familiar with, but is it a miracle that we fully comprehend why he did what he did in the audience that he had? 
So let's take a quick look here before we commune with the Lord today. In Luke chapter 5, verse 17, we find through 20, Luke 5, 17 through 20. Let's take a look at this section of scripture here. Luke 5 and 17 says, one day he was teaching and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law who are scribes sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. See, there are some significant things that we see in this one verse here in Luke 5 and 17. First of all, we find out that the audience that Jesus is teaching to this day is not only to just the regular people who followed him around, but now there are some Pharisees and some teachers of the law who have come to check Jesus out. And they wanted to find out about Jesus because they're hearing so much about him. So they wanted to see him for themselves. They wanted to know who is he. They wanted to know what does he want. And they wanted to know why are the people so attracted to this man called Jesus. Is he sincere? These are some very good questions. These are the same questions that we should have when we want to know more about Jesus. Who is he? What does he want from me? Why should I be attracted to Jesus? And is he really the one that I can depend on? Is he sincere? Is he faithful? Can I cast my hope and my fears uh, and my cares rather upon him? So they came out of curiosity, but they came to interrogate Jesus. They, they wanted to observe what he was going to teach and what he was going to say. But look at what the word said. It said that the power of the Lord was present. To heal them. We know that God's power is always available, but there is a time when God does a miraculous thing, not just amen, sustain us and carry us, but this day it said that the power was, was present to heal them. The, the power was present to do something out of the ordinary, not just for Jesus to teach, but to amen, heal those who were there with him. So, amen, we understand that when God pours out special blessings, he does it for a special reason. And for these people who came to check Jesus out, God wanted to reveal to them that this is my only beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Hear him what he says. So what will it take for you to hear Jesus? You need to see him in action. You need to understand that what he says he means and what he means he says. So the Bible says, amen, in verse number 18, 5 and 18, Luke 5 and 18, and some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him. But not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. And seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. Now, there's a lot that's going on here, right? We see that these men, some men were carrying this, their friend who was paralyzed. He was on a bed. He was on a cot, a stretcher. He could not walk by himself. In Mark 2, Verses 1 through 3, we get a little bit more information about what's, who these friends are and what's happening. So in Mark 2, let me just read this very quickly. Mark 2, verses 1 through 3, it tells us when he, Jesus, had come back to Capernaum, several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. Jesus had already been out teaching and preaching and performing miracles throughout uh, the countryside and wherever he had gone. So the word of Jesus, the notoriety about Jesus had been spreading. So when he came back to his home base of Capernaum, I mean, people were flocking to his home. Verse 2, and many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Some people couldn't even push in even more to get in through the door. And verse 3 said, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. So we now understand that, amen, back up in Luke 5, uh, verses 
uh, 19 and 20, these friends of this paralytic, there were four of them. And they brought him in, but they couldn't push in. They, they couldn't get through the crowd. Everybody in the crowd wanted something from Jesus. Most of them came not only to just see what he was going to do, but many of them, I'm sure, had a special need. And they had heard that he was the needs meter. So they came, but these men would not be denied. These friends would not be denied. Oh, man, isn't it good to have people that you can depend upon? This man who was on this stretcher was at their mercy, but he had confidence in them because they were his friends. So they went up the steps to get to the rooftop and they began to take the tiles off of this ceiling, which was the, uh, uh, the materials that these roofs were made uh, like there in the Palestine days of Palestine. They were able to, to remove tiles from the roof and they moved enough of them so that one man on each edge, most likely four of them, were able to I mean, drop and uh, uh, lower down their friend into the very midst of Jesus. And the Bible says Jesus was teaching. And can you imagine teaching and then look it up? And here comes a man in the ceiling to interrupt your teaching. He's being dropped down right into the and right in front of Jesus. And in Luke 5, 20, Jesus said, I mean, seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. Now, this could be very confusing. If people didn't understand, why was Jesus speaking to the man's most pressing need, but not his most obvious need? See, our most pressing need is to know that whenever we do something wrong, we can repent and our sins will be forgiven us. And Jesus has said, I am the sin forgiver. I'm here. But first of all, you got to present yourself to me. And these friends allowed this paralytic who had a very obvious need for physical healing, but Jesus spoke to him and said, listen, your sins have been forgiven you. Jesus was speaking to the thing that the man really needed the most, even though it wasn't his most, uh, in his estimation, immediate need. We must learn to always ask God to forgive us for whatever we may have done wrong. That's our most pressing need. Whether we know it or not, yes, we need finances. Yes, we might need physical healing. Yes, we might need a little joy in our life. Yes, we might need somebody to show up and to help us out to do some physical things. But our most pressing eternal need is to have our sins forgiven. So forgiveness is the miracle that keeps on giving. Why? It costs the greatest price. It costs Jesus his very life, and it never stops giving. Forgiveness is available to each one of us when we repent and ask God to forgive us. So Jesus looked up, and he knew what was really needed. He knew that, amen, the teacher wanted to forgive the sins before he dealt with the physical man. But not only that, see, there were these Pharisees and, 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 and these uh, scribes of the law who were sitting there. And they had come to hear what Jesus was going to say. And they had heard that Jesus said that he is the son of God. That he is God himself, basically. Amen. He's the Messiah. He's the one that Israel has been waiting for. And so when they see this sick man being brought in before Jesus and then Jesus speaks to them and says, look, your sins have been forgiven you. Jesus, the atmosphere. He set up something that only Jesus himself could do to prove that he was the son of God as he had said or else he was going to prove himself to be an imposter. And that's the same thing today. Either Jesus is who he said that he was that he is, rather, he is the son of God, or everything that he has said about himself has been nothing but a lie. And so if he was not resurrected from the dead, like he said he was going to be, then, amen, people could say that Jesus was not who he claimed to be. So Jesus is setting himself right here for his first test with these Pharisees and these scribes. Why? Because the Pharisees and the rabbis of that day would teach that there is no sick man, sick man who can be healed of his sickness until all his sins have been forgiven him. That was their teaching. If you were sick, they believed that, amen, you were sick because God was angry with you. 
And so in order for you to be healed, they taught that your sins had to be forgiven before you could be healed. See, Jesus is not just saying things out of order. He knows who his audience is. He knows who he's trying to reach to let them know that I'm doing this so that you would know. I'm doing this so that you would know who I am. I'm doing this so that you would not be confused when you leave here about my mission and why I came. I'm doing this so that whatever reason and excuse that you have in your own mind for not obeying me, I'm going to deal with it right now. And he does the same thing with us today. Jesus realizes there are so many of us, we all need him. But there are so many people who want to play games with Jesus, who want to play games with God and say, Lord, if you do this for me, then I would do that for you. And God in his mercy many times would just say, okay, because you really don't get it yet, I'm really going to show you who I am. And then when I show you who I am, is your heart really going to come to me sincerely or are you going to still be out on the periphery? trying to continue to play games. So Jesus said, I'm going to deal with the rabbi and I'm going to deal, I'm, I'm sorry, the teachers, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and also the regular people who would just come seeking to know who God is better. So because that was their teaching, Jesus said, I'm going to deal with you right in the midst of your teaching. So then Jesus asked the question, in Luke 5, 21, 24, these scribes and Pharisees began to reason as we read in the opening section of Scripture. They began to say, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? He's claiming to be God because only God can forgive sin. And see, they were correct in their assessment. Only God can forgive sin. And people sometimes, amen, don't quite get that. That's why they walk around and say, I think God may have forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. What is that? Think about what you're saying. I can't forgive myself. You're right. You cannot forgive yourself. You don't have the capacity to forgive yourself. We cannot forgive ourselves. That's not our job. Only God can forgive sin. But because of Jesus, he's already forgiven our sin. We don't have to forgive ourselves. We have to accept the fact that we have been forgiven by God already. And then get up from there. Get ready to pick up your cot. Get ready to get up from lying down in a do-nothing state of mind and be ready to move like this paralyzed man was. But here Jesus began to talk to them. Amen. And they said, when they were thinking this in 522, Jesus was aware of their reasoning. See, we can have innermost thoughts. And when these uh, teachers of the law were having their thoughts, they thought to themselves, the Lord began to tell them what they were thinking. If they were really spiritual, something should have clicked right then. And said, oh, this is a special man here. He must be from God. He knows exactly what I'm thinking. Jesus said, why are you reasoning in your hearts? You're not speaking this. I know what you're thinking in your heart. But let me ask you, which is easier to say? Your sins have been forgiven or to say, get up and walk. Which is easier to say? You need, you need God to do both. You need God to forgive sins and you need God to heal. So Jesus said, which is easier? Neither one is easier but there's one that can be most apparent. See, I can tell you that your sins have been forgiven, but that's an inside thing. That's between God and you. Nobody can actually see that. But the healing is the most difficult thing because that's going to be evidence right in front of your face. Why do you think God does awesome things for us? Why do you think he gives us I mean, the evidence that he lives, that he cares, that he's concerned? We know that he has promised to forgive us. We know that he has promised us eternal life. But right now, he puts on display his love for us every day. So Jesus simply asks, which is easier to say? I can easily say his sins are forgiven, but you can't see that. But let me tell you something here. So then he said, but so that you may know, verse 24, this is our key verse. I'm reading it again and again and again. But so that you may know, God wants us to know this thing. God wants us to comprehend how truly awesome he is, how much he really loves us, how much he's really concerned about us so that we may know he does these things for us. So that you may know that the son of man 
has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, me, Jesus, the Messiah, the living one, the holy one, the one who has come to set you free, I say to you, get up. Oh, didn't God speak that to you? If he hasn't spoken that to you, amen. You need to ask him, Lord, I want to get up, Lord. I'm tired of lying down on this cot. I need to get up here. I came to you wounded and worn and heavy, Lord, in my sin. I'm lying down oppressed by sin. But, Lord, if you just speak the word and say, get up, I know I'll have the strength to get up from there. I know I'll have the strength to cast out all of this, these pressures and these cares and this hate, God, and these demonic forces that keep speaking into my mind, telling me not only to harm myself but to harm other people. That's what's happening today. People are giving in to that spirit that has oppressed and depressed them so much that hate is just running rampant. And, in, and they think that if they kill somebody, kill the source who they think is an individual that's causing them that hate, then they'll feel better. And if they don't feel better, they'll say, I'm ready to leave here anyway. So I'm going to take them out and I'm going right with them. What type of thinking is this? They need to have Jesus to speak into their life and say, get up from there. Pick up your stretcher. You came in riding, laying on your stretcher, but when you go out of here, your stretcher's going to be laying on you. When you came in, you were burdened down with all type of worry and stress and wonder, God, when will you show up in my life? But when you finish communing with God in your prayer closet, amen, you'll be able to get up from there and you'll be able to carry that stretcher out and throw it away. I don't need this hindering anymore. I don't need this little help anymore. I got Jesus now. I'm not going to be lying down. I'm going to get up. And then he said, and go home. Where's your home? Your home should be with Jesus. Jesus should be your home. Jesus should be in your heart. Jesus should be all that we need. And verse 25, Luke 5 and 25, once Jesus said this, once, amen, the tension had been set in the room, the Pharisees and the scribes were there wondering now, what's going to happen now? He's already speaking this word. So there's tension everywhere. And the owner of the house whose roof they have just torn up, is looking up and wondering, is this going to be worth it? They just destroyed my roof. These men who were holding this paralytic on the cot said, look, we had faith enough to hold him, to get him down there, but we are not thinking about having to pull him back up. No, we believe that Jesus is going to heal him, and we won't have to be concerned about trying to pull all this weight back up again. When you give Jesus your weight, you don't want to pick it back up and have to bring it back up again. It was a test in front of where Jesus was to see, does he have the authority? And the paralyzed man was sitting there wondering, Lord, now what's going to happen to me? I'm in front of Jesus. So Jesus spoke the word when he said, get up. And verse 25 says, immediately he got up. Immediately. When Jesus speaks a word in your life, the word that he speaks, he's able to bring it to pass. When the Holy Spirit comes into your heart and you sync yourself up with Jesus, it don't take forever for you to get or, or to become a new creation in him, to let that old man die away, to let people know that you're no longer the same person that you used to be. The Bible says immediately he got up before them. He was the evidence. The Lord said, is it easier to heal or is it easier to say your sins are forgiven? So now that he has healed, the thing that he said he was going to do, so they then also had to understand that, then, hey, if he's able to heal, then he's able to forgive sin. Because the rabbi taught them that the only way that the man could be healed if his sin were forgiven. So Jesus used their own understanding to prove that he is who he said that he is. Amen. So that you may know that I am who I said that I am. Let me give you these few things here you can just write down. How can you learn to rely on the power of God? How can you learn to rely on this enormous power of God? The first thing is you need to choose to remember 
the things that God has already done. You must choose to remember what God has already done. Psalm 105, verses 4 and 5. Psalm 105, verses 4 and 5 says, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his wonders, which he has done, his marvels and the judgments uttered by his mouth. Seek the Lord and his strength and remember his wonders, what he has done. That will strengthen you to know and to always rely on the power of God. The second thing is we must learn to cease trusting in our own frail efforts and hand our resources over to the one who can do anything. We don't have the strength to handle every situation in life. But whatever we have, whatever God has blessed us with, we give it over to him. And then in our weakness, he takes control of everything and blesses us. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9 said, 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, and he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. The third thing is we must remember that prayer is a vital part of relying on the power of God. Remember the, the prayer, the model prayer, when the Lord said, uh, he said, let thy will be done. In Luke 11 and 2 in the King James Verse, after hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, he said, thy will, thy power, let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. The fourth thing is to remember that the resurrection of Jesus demonstrates the great power of God and is the great hope of all believers. The resurrection of Jesus is what demonstrates the great power of God and is the great hope of all believers. John 14 and 19. John 14 and 19. Jesus speaks and he says, after a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live you will live also. Amen. And finally, number five, we have the assurance that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or think or imagine according to his power, according to his power, according to his power that is at work within us. And that's Ephesians 3.20. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. So that you may know that he has power to heal so that you may know that he has power to forgive so that you may know that he is all that we'll ever need, that he's already done everything that we can ever hope for or look for to be released to have a word to speak, a word of life and encouragement and peace and joy into this world that we live in. This world is so corrupt. This world is so out of control. And every time it looks like somebody's going to show up to be a source of help, they let us down. But the thing about God is so that we may know that we are not without hope, that we have hope, that we have him. And when we have him, we have it all. So that we may know. The Lord said, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk that you are healed. I say to you, the Lord has already spoken. He said, I'm showing you who I am by the miraculous power that I possess in your life right now. And when you see my works on display in your life, you'll know that when I told you that you are forgiven, then you are forgiven and you have a place waiting with me forevermore 
in the name of Jesus so that you may know that he is who he said that he is. We are saved. I pray that this word has blessed somebody today that you, amen, in your time of weakness, and we all have a time of weakness, but we must understand that God's word is full of examples and demonstrations of the power that he possesses. When Zerubbabel was trying to build, amen, a temple, and he knew that it was too much for him, God spoke to him and reminded him that what he was about to do, it was not by might nor by man's strength, but by his spirit, by his power, whatever you need to have done, it's not going to be accomplished by your might or your strength. It's because God is making his power available to you. But if you don't know him, if you don't know this Jesus that we've been talking about today, then none of these promises from the word of the Lord would do you any good. But we don't want anybody to be seeking the Lord, have opportunity to find him, and not accept that opportunity. So right now, before we commune, amen, and we're getting ready to commune, the next thing that we're about to do is to commune with the Lord. But before we do that, if you're listening to this message today, and something has been said that has caused you to reflect upon your life or your current situation and circumstance, and you want to say, Lord, I want your power to operate in my life. Lord, I need your power. Here I am, Lord. Lord, I have been having trouble not only forgiving other people, but I've been having trouble forgiving me. Now I understand. I don't have the authority to forgive myself because you have already forgiven me, God. If I acknowledge Jesus, you said I'm already forgiven. So I ask you and invoke you today, I beseech you, to think about what the word of God has promised you if you are not saved if you've not given your life to him. And if you desire to give your life to the Lord today, before we commune, we want to give you the opportunity to repeat this prayer of salvation and repentance. And if you mean what you pray, you're saved right now, not tomorrow, not next week, not in an hour. But if you mean it, confess with your mouth and believe it in your heart, the word of God says you are saved now. So if you desire to give your life to the Lord, I just ask that you honor your heart right now and repeat these words after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me for all of my sins. Come into my heart, be my Lord and my Savior. Whatever is wrong, I will no longer do. Whatever is right, that will I do. I thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. I thank you, Jesus, for being resurrected for me so that when I do come up a little short and I cry out and repent, I know that you are my advocate with the Father and that I am forgiven. So I thank you for saving me. I am saved. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Father, we thank you for your word on today. We thank you, O oh Lord, that we do know that you alone have accomplished everything that needs to be done. God, we receive your blessings. We receive, O oh God, with thankfulness the Holy Spirit that you have granted to each born again believer and the power that resides within us is you. God, we are in you as you are in us right now. And because we have your power in us, we are able to tell Satan no on every hand. God, he can only get us if he deceives us. So we rebuke every spirit of deception right now, and we stand flat-footed around the cross of Jesus the Christ, saying, Lord, we thank you for the blood that's already covered us and set us free. And now, Lord, as we prepare to commune as another sign of our faithfulness and our thankfulness, we just ask you to bless the bread, the crackers, the water, the juice, whatever your people are going to use right now. We pray that you will sanctify these sacraments so that we will be on one accord. Then, and as we pray, oh God, we thank you for hearing this prayer. And as we commune with you, we thank you, O oh Lord, for being in our midst right now. And we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise that belongs to you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen 
amen and amen. Well, God bless you today, amen. We ask at this time now, if you would get your cups, your water, your juice, whatever you're going to use, your bread, your crackers, amen. And as you get it right now, in a spirit of humility and thankfulness, began to just think about the body of Jesus that was beaten, that this bread was symbolized. Think about the blood of Jesus the Christ that was shed, that this cup was symbolized. And then as you get your sacrament together, your cracker or your bread, and hold it up as we go to the throne of the Lord in spirit right now and remind each one of us that the same night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Eat ye all of it. After they had supped, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Drink ye all of it. You have done the will of the Lord. Truly, I pray that wherever you are, you're giving God a great big hand clap of praise so that we may know, so that we may continue to be thankful and grateful of who our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ is. He proved to all who came that so that no one would have an excuse. This is the grace of God. He demonstrates to each one, no matter what their profession or their beliefs are, that he is who he said that he is. Thank God for all that has been done. We pray that, amen, you will have a wonderfully blessed week, that you will continue to stand and be steadfast and un unmovable for our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Until we gather together on next week, we pray in, amen, the Lord says the same, amen. You will see the announcement slides that will be coming up very shortly. But on next Sunday, the second Sunday in this month, we ask that you would join us here, if you can, in person. And if not, just tune in via Facebook Live and just let the Lord continue to be in the midst of each and every one of us. And now as we prepare to go forward from this place, well, Father, we thank you once again for all that you continue to do for us. You continue to meet us at our appointed place of need. And now as we go down from this place today, but not from your presence we pray that you will cover us wherever we go and however we travel and let us arrive safely at our appointed places of destination. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the love of God and the, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide henceforth now and forevermore. We go in peace and we sin no more. God bless you. You are dismissed in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen.